Today, Final Fantasy XIV is one of the most popular MMOs with a passionate fanbase. But that definitely wasn't always the case. The game completely failed before popping a phoenix down and coming back to life. And this is how. The year is 1999. I see. With the mass adoption of the internet, the idea of what multiplayer RPGs could be was growing. You had games like Neverwinter Nights, not, not that one, but this one, pushing the limits of what players could do online. In 1997, Richard Garriott coined the phrase MMORPG for the latest installment of the long-running RPG series Ultima, Ultima Online. But nothing would make a splash quite like 1999's EverQuest. It quickly surpassed the behemoth of the time, Ultima Online, in subscriptions. Whereas Ultima Online peaked at 250,000 subscriptions, EverQuest more than doubled that, with a peak of 550,000 active accounts. It also won GameSpot's coveted Game of the Year for PC games. Hey wait, that's us! Don't look at me though, I wasn't allowed to play EverQuest. I didn't even hit puberty yet. Back in Japan, or rather Hawaii, actually, Hironobu Sakaguchi, creator of Final Fantasy, was working on Final Fantasy's feature film, The Spirits Within. At the time, Sakaguchi, developer Squaresoft, and the Final Fantasy franchise were on top of the world. Final Fantasy VII had released two years prior, in 1997, and went on to sell over 10 million copies, becoming PlayStation's second highest selling game of all time. Final Fantasy VIII, released in 1999, closely trailed that, selling 8.6 million copies. So, Sakaguchi-san set up Square Pictures in Hawaii to work on a major feature film for the franchise, and to surf. I'm actually being half serious. Sakaguchi absolutely loves surfing, and it's my hunch that he chose Hawaii for that reason. And not because, you know, it's like right in between Japan and the mainland states. Whatever. I do the same thing in his position. Anyways, while in Hawaii, Sakaguchi discovered and was impressed by Western MMOs, especially EverQuest. It was then that Hironobu Sakaguchi decided that it was time to create a Final Fantasy MMORPG. So, let's fast forward to the future. Hey, hey, Devante, Devante, stop, stop doing this to me! 2000, Final Fantasy IX comes out to 5.5 million sales. Still okay, but much worse than FF7 and 8. 2001, Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, the movie from Square Pictures, releases and it's a big ol' flop. So much so, Enix almost didn't merge with Square as they were worried about how much money they'd lost on the film. 2001, Final Fantasy X also releases. Thankfully, it's a big success and sells 8.5 million units. And we arrive at 2002, Hironobu Sakaguchi's MMORPG idea finally coming to fruition. It's fine. Final Fantasy XI. And it's doing... Uh... Okay. The amount of time, money, and investment in Final Fantasy XI couldn't be matched by initial sales as the game had cost roughly 17 to 25 million dollars to make. There's also the fact that you need to maintain an online game and can't just ship it, plus Square was working on expansions. That is, at least in its first year. But luckily, with MMOs, you get that sweet revenue from subscription fees. While today, many MMO games are free to play and use other means of making money, back during the EverQuest days, it was standard to have a monthly fee in order to play the game. And with Final Fantasy XI, that fee was about 12 bucks a month. So by December 2003, thanks to these regular fees, over a year after its Japanese release, Final Fantasy XI was finally breaking even. And amazingly, by 2012, Square Enix's then-CEO Yuichi Wada stated that Final Fantasy XI had become the most profitable Final Fantasy game ever. But of course, times were moving on, and in 2004, another little game you've probably never heard of came out. So I'll let you in on it. Bad Boys Miami Takedown What the hell? Also, World of Warcraft. While online gaming was definitely getting bigger and bigger, World of Warcraft was a phenomenon. By 2008, we're talking over 10 million monthly subscribers. 
That's on top of the fact that you also had to purchase a retail copy of the game. So while Final Fantasy XI was profitable for Square, I mean, it's not 10 million monthly subscribers profitable. So they wanted a serious competitor to World of Warcraft. So in 2005, one year after the release of World of Warcraft, planning on Final Fantasy XIV began. Nobuaki Komodo, who was a director on Final Fantasy XI, would direct XIV, and Hiromichi Tanaka, who had worked on multiple Final Fantasy games and produced Final Fantasy XI, would act as a producer. Then E3 2009, XIV was announced for a 2010 release date. And after an alpha test in March of 2010 and beta test in early September, the game was released on September 30th to PC, and oof, a 49 out of 100 on Metacritic with a user score of 3.9 out of 10. Nobuo Uematsu's music deserves better. Final Fantasy XIV, compared to other MMOs of the time, did have some impressive elements to it, for example, the graphics were far superior, and your character didn't look like their hair was a block of cheese. And as I mentioned, Nobuo Oimatsu was one of the composers on the game, and his music is pretty much always insanely awesome. But it was glitchy, and had horrendously unintuitive gameplay systems, and was viewed as a worse game than Final Fantasy XI by Final Fantasy XI fans, who were, you know, the target audience. Players were pissed. The user interface was so bad, it was like fighting with the game itself to play. And in general, the gameplay just wasn't fun. According to now director of FF14, Naoki Yoshida, who would later work on A Realm Reborn, the architecture and just how the servers were set up were already problematic. They were broken. If your server has a problem and you're trying to make an online RPG, it's like your planet is deficient. Remember how I mentioned you typically had to pay a monthly subscription fee for MMOs? Well, in order to entice players to keep playing, they'd typically give you a free 30-day trial after you purchase the game. But FF14 was viewed so poorly, and had so many players pissed, that Square Enix extended that 30-day trial not once, but twice! Eventually, monthly fees for the game were suspended. Both Nobuaki Komodo and Hiromichi Tanaka were taken off the project, and Tanaka took responsibility. The game was supposed to release on both PC and PS3, but was indefinitely delayed for the PS3. I'm still holding out for that PS3 1.0 release. Any day now. I'm telling ya. Here's how poorly Final Fantasy XIV performed for Square Enix. For the fiscal year of 2011, Square Enix dropped its estimated income for the year by 90%. At the 2011 Tokyo Game Show, CEO Yuichi Wada apologized for Final Fantasy XIV and stated that Final Fantasy, as a brand, had been greatly damaged by it. But, like a phoenix, Final Fantasy XIV would rise again. While Square Enix was absolutely reeling from the disaster that was Final Fantasy XIV, instead of investing more into it and trying to further convince players to play the game, they decided to do something kind of crazy. After essentially five years of development, in 2011, Square Enix decided to scrap the entire game and basically start fresh. That is a lot of lost money. So April 2011, development began on Final Fantasy XIV 2.0, which would later be dubbed A Realm Reborn. Naoki Yoshida, who had worked as the chief planner on 2012's Dragon Quest X, was brought in to take charge as both the director and producer on this new version of Final Fantasy XIV. As I mentioned in Yoshida's previous quote, he discovered that the architecture of the game was fundamentally flawed, so he had the team create a brand new game engine and server structure. In order to win back fan trust, Yoshida had the team maintain the original FF14 while working on A Realm Reborn and began writing letters from the producer in January 2011, a series of posts where he would address fan concerns and feedback while being as transparent as possible. In these posts, he'd reveal the results of polls the company took and genuinely took the time to respond in a meaningful and respectful way. In his first post, he made it clear the team was taking fan concerns seriously and were actively trying to address the problems and revealed in what types of ways they were trying to. He speaks of seeing the results of players disliking the combat system and lack of in-game content and affirms that he plans to completely redo the combat system. And by July of 2011, the team had already implemented changes to improve on shortcomings he spoke about with patch 1.18. But it was just a stopgap to throw current players a bone while version 2.0, or Realm Reborn, was being worked on. Even though A Realm Reborn was a totally new game, it would still be called Final Fantasy XIV to gain back player trust. 
because it would be good. I swear. Meanwhile, on the business side of things, October 2011, version 2.0 was announced, and current players of 14 would be given access to version 2.0 for free, with the character data all transferable, and, uh, monthly fees would begin again in January 2012. Okay, that one's not so good. But at some point, you do have to make enough money to both make and maintain the game. That said, Square Enix made it so if players did keep paying monthly fees for at least three months before 2.0's release, they'd get a permanent reduction in monthly fees. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's great that they're making you pay money to pay less money, but it is cool if you were planning on playing the game anyways. After nearly two years of development, in November of 2012, servers for Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 were shut down in preparation for an alpha test of A Realm Reborn later that month. But what had never been seen before was the Wave 1.0 shut down. It was in miraculous fashion, with a calamitous event in game that would play into the ongoing story of the game and work as a parallel to its development, which then led directly into A Realm Reborn's first trailer. So, what was Yoshida going to do for A Realm Reborn? Well, he outlines a lot of this in a later 2014 GDC presentation. Yoshida felt one major issue was that the former team were too focused on good graphics, instead of performance, which is a major issue for an online game and part of why the game had been so buggy. So he reeled back on trying to have state-of-the-art graphics to make a game that was actually playable. I mean, one example of this is, take this flower pot. It is so pretty. It's beautiful, and he hated it. He hated it with a passion. It was incredibly stupid to make. Not you. You're okay. You see, this flower pot contained over 1,000 polygons and 150 lines of shader code. In other words, the same amount of resources as a single player character. I think you can start to see where there might be an issue. By including so many assets like this, as pretty as the game looked, you couldn't fit more than 20 characters on screen at a time as a result. Which, for a genre titled Massively Multiplayer, that's kinda an issue. So none of that! A Realm Reborn would have crappy graphics! I mean, comparatively. They were still fine for an MMO. Next up on Yoshida's list, Game Masters. At the time of creating FF14, Square was fixated on having a specific Game Master craft each game experience. But with an MMO, that quickly becomes an issue because, well, they're massive and have so many systems at play that need to work in a multiplayer setting. So instead, while he'd oversee the project and quickly provide input and approve design decisions, he'd also have a team of lead designers who he'd trust to make major decisions as well, so they could quickly move forward. This was key to Yoshida, as teams working on different systems of FF14 version 1.0 apparently didn't communicate or work together at all, so he wanted to ensure the teams understood what other teams were doing and therefore could design a more cohesive game. Next up, a reliance on patches. Because it had worked with FF11, Square thought they could just rely on a slow release of patches to fix fundamental flaws of the game. But that wouldn't work here. Yoshida wasn't about that noise, and felt it was a terrible lack of planning. Another thing he did, by the way, was he forced less experienced staff members to replay OG FF14 over and over again to make sure that they understood why it sucked. You will play the game, dammit! Sir, please, no more! More FF14! More! <laughs> you also had them play World of Warcraft and other good MMOs so they could learn what was good and bad. He wanted to go back to game design fundamentals and focus on a fun gameplay experience. Which is kinda key to a game you'd actually want to play. That included a commitment to level design, where you'd have different teams work on different regions of the game in order to foster competition within Square to create a better and more fun area. He viewed an MMORPG like running a country, where the players are the citizens and likened it to if citizens are unhappy, they'll move out of your country, so it was important for the devs to actively and regularly listen to their citizens, or players, and keep them on board. And after two years and eight months of work on Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn, on August 27, 2013, it was finally released. And unlike OG FF14, new FF14 was viewed as terrible. Wait, hold on, sorry, wrong version. It was viewed as good? Like, not the greatest thing ever, but surprisingly good. In general, 
the sentiment was total shock at how much Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn had improved compared to the original Final Fantasy XIV by both critics and fans alike. It was even named the best MMO of the year by several outlets. The game sold well enough that by the fiscal year of 2014, Square Enix lauded Final Fantasy XIV as the reason they were profitable again after a less than stellar 2013. And thanks to their subscription model, Final Fantasy XIV just kept making money to the point where, after multiple patches, Naoki Yoshida could finally work on genuine major expansions. These expansions weren't just new story quests or raids, I mean, those were there too. Each of them also included major gameplay elements added to the game, from new character classes to features like flying, swimming, and diving, revamping the combat system, new areas, playable races, and more. Each expansion only served to make the game better, more notable in the MMO community, and bring in yet a larger player base. Through four expansions, FF14 has also gained notoriety as a beloved story in the franchise which defies the MMO label but lives up to the Final Fantasy name. And as content updates rolled out over the decades since, Yoshida still does his letter from the producer routinely as a livestream. By April 2021, there were 22 million registered players for FF14. And by the release of Endwalker in 2021, that number had risen to 24 million. Not only that, but Final Fantasy XIV had become the most profitable Final Fantasy game ever for Square Enix. And that is how Final Fantasy XIV saved itself. You know, the funny thing is, before writing this episode, I actually thought Final Fantasy XI was a failure. I had no idea that it had become so successful. Also, the more I read about how Yoshida handled the FF14 situation, the more respect I've gained for him. He seems genuinely awesome. Anyways, please consider checking out our previous episodes. We have a whole playlist.